And it's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Aaron Sams. Hi, John. Well, welcome. Thanks. So uh, for our viewing audience, please welcome Dr. Aaron J. Sams, Principal Scientist at Embark Veterinary. Dr. Sams received his PhD in Biological Anthropology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and subsequently served as a postdoctoral research associate in the Department of Biological Statistics and Computational Biology at Cornell University. Dr. Sams is a population geneticist who values using scientific research to provide beneficial technologies and services to the world. As a trained anthropologist, Dr. Sams learned to connect his scientific research to human narratives, past and present. He uses that lens to focus his efforts as a leader in research and development at Embark and believes that as humans, we owe it to dogs, our earliest animal companions, to ensure their health and well-being. He's one of my favorite presenters, and today Dr. Sams will speak on patterns and consequences of inbreeding in domestic dogs. Thanks again for joining us, Dr. Sams. All right. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so, so thanks again, John, and everyone at Embark who has worked so hard to put together this summit. Um, I'm really excited to be able to participate um, and present this information to, to this audience. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the patterns and consequences of inbreeding in dogs. Um, before I get too deep into that, um, I want to make sure we're all on the same page about kind of vocabulary that I'm going to use um, throughout this talk. So for example, inbreeding, what is it? It's the production of offspring from the mating of genetically related individuals. That seems kind of obvious, but just to make sure we're, we all understand that definition. Um, when inbreeding occurs, when two related individuals mate and produce offspring, those offspring, there's a chance that those offspring are going to inherit two copies of DNA that's identical. Um, and we call that identical by descent because that DNA, that, that identical DNA is inherited from a common ancestor. And then finally, we can measure inbreeding and the impact of inbreeding through something called a coefficient of inbreeding, which you're going to see in this talk abbreviated as COI, or in population genetics, we use the letter F to represent inbreeding. I mean, there's two kind of common definitions for um, inbreeding co coefficients. One is um, thinking about COIs as a probability that a genetic locus, any given genetic locus in a genome is going to be IBD. Um, but we can also think about it as a measurement of a single individual and, and the fraction of their genome that we, we observe to be IBD. So I'm going to go into a little bit more depth into each of those. Uh, so how do we measure inbreeding? Um, we can measure inbreeding with pedigrees. I think uh, many of our breeders in the audience already know this. Um, we can do that because we know that each parent is transmitting half of their genome, a random half, to each of their offspring. Um, and we can trace the connections between individuals, potential mates, um, and calculate their coefficients of relationship. Uh, so in this case, you're seeing two individuals, B and C, um, each of which are related through their mother, so they're half-siblings um, through individual A that are going to produce an offspring, D, um, and we can calculate their, their coefficient of relationship um, pretty simply if we assume that that the top of this pedigree, all individuals are unrelated. Um, so so because each indiv individual A is contributing half of their genome um, to each of B and C, independently, um, their coefficient of relationship is going to be 25%. Um, and then that related, that, that identical DNA that's inherited in B and C, um, there, there's a 50% chance they're going to, that's going to get transmitted to their offspring. So that kinship or inbreeding coefficient is just the relationship divided by two. Um, so one eighth, All right? So it's, it's, this kind of, the, the math can get a lot more complicated when there's a lot of inbreeding in a pedigree, but that's a pretty simple example. And the, the point I want to make here is that these are probabilities. Um, when we're using pedigrees, we're, we're estimating probabilities that that DNA is going to be IBD. But let's look at it in a little more, bit more depth. When we actually look at the DNA, um, at, at the DNA level, um, so like I said, we're kind of assuming that individual A here is outbred. Um, so both copies of its, D, of its genome are different. Um, they're not identical at all. So I'm representing that with two different colors here in this chromosome diagram on the right. Um, that individual is going to transmit half of its genome, as I said, randomly, because recombination can shuffle the DNA in individual A when it's transmitted to its offspring. Um, so we see in individuals B and C, they're inheriting half of, of individual A's genome, but it's different halves. And then again, that's going to happen again as those two 
um, contribute to, to their offspring. And so the, the outcome of this in individual D is that we have blocks of that genome where their DNA on both sides coming from both parents is identical by descent from individual A. So you're seeing that as this, this shared block of green DNA. And those are, that's what we actually want to measure. When we use genetic data to measure inbreeding, we're looking for those shared blocks uh, of, of identical DNA. And so we call those runs of homozygosity because we're looking at the DNA and we're looking for long stretches where all of the genotypes that we measure are homozygous. They're the same allele on both on both copies of the DNA. So those are stretches of a chromosome where both copies of an individual's DNA is identical. And that's actually exactly what we, it's, you know, we kind of simply take, we measure all those runs of homozygosity, we add them up, we add up their length, and then we divide that by the genome size. And that's how we calculate a simple genetic coefficient of inbreeding. So just to show that visually, right, we we're taking all those green blocks and we're dividing them by the total length of the genome, which is the green plus the gray. So coming back to this, the, the main point I want to make is when we're measuring those inbreeding coefficients from pedigrees, we're, we're getting that probability. So we're, we're, we're saying that at each position of the genome, there's a one eighth chance that individual D is going to be inbred. But when we actually measure how much of the genome is inbred in practice, it can vary quite a bit from that estimate. So the take home point there is that these pedigree based COIs are probabilities. They, they're not accounting directly for uh, variation in recombination across individuals. We can look at that a little bit differently by looking at, instead of a single individual, let's look at a litter. Um, so again, um, because, because we're, we, we, we're estimating a probability, if we look across a litter, all of the individuals, um, if we use a pedigree, are going to have the same predicted inbreeding coefficient. But if we measure them directly with genetic data, they're going to vary around that. But what if our pedigree is somehow incomplete? or has errors in it. Um, so for example, <clears throat> in this case, we, we think that, that our two parents of this litter are half siblings, but what if we didn't know that the two sires of, of those two individuals were related, they were full siblings. So in this case, our individuals are actually cryptic three quarter siblings instead of half siblings. When we, if we have a case like that and we measure those inbreeding coefficients directly, they're gonna be a lot higher than what we would expect from the pedigree itself. Um, so that's that's kind of the take home point too, is that pedigrees can be incomplete. Um, they can be incorrect in some ways. You can have mistaken paternity and things like that. Um, and when you have incompleteness or errors in a pedigree, that's gonna lead to large underestimation of COIs. Um, so what we like to do is measure those COIs directly with genome-wide genetic data. And we do this. Um, at Embark, we do this with every single customer um, dog that we process, we're, we're measuring its inbreeding coefficient with those runs of homozygosity. Um, and when we, a couple of years ago, we published a paper looking at this across a large sample of purebred dogs. Um, so what you're seeing here are uh, data from 11 common breeds. Um, and it, there's a couple of things to note here. You know, what you're seeing is variation within and across breeds. So within breeds, you're seeing, you know, about a 10 to 12 percent variation um, within each breed. For most dogs, although there's a lot of outliers, as you can see. Um, and then across breeds, there's also a lot of variation. So you see about half of these breeds, their median uh, inbreeding coefficient is about 20%, but there's some, some big outliers such as Doberman Pinschers and Bulldogs, which are closer to 40%. So that's one way we can look at the data and think about variation within and across breeds. Um, there are other ways we can look at, at the genetic data here as well. Um, so for example, how, how did those breeds accrue their inbreeding over time. We can look at the actual distribution of the, those segments of inbreeding, those runs of homozygosity. We can line them up within a breed, sort them by their length, uh, and plot them like this. And, and this can be kind of interesting because it tells us something about the history of inbreeding in these breeds. So for example, what I'm highlighting with the arrow here is, is a comparison between Doberman Pinschers and, and Bulldogs. Um, both of those are inbred to about the same degree with medians around 40%. But what you're seeing is that the steepness of that Doberman Pinscher curve um, is a lot higher. And, and that means that more of the inbreeding is held in long runs of homozygosity compared to bulldogs where they're kind of medium length runs of homozygosity. Those longer segments of inbreeding are likely to have been inherited more recently 
than the ones that we're seeing in bulldogs. And that's interesting because it's pretty consistent with what we know about the history of these breeds. We know that Dobermans have accrued a lot of inbreeding over the last century. Bulldogs um, went through a, a heavy bottleneck in about the 1830s with the end of bull baiting in England. So, so it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, it, it's a good sign that, that our data is cons consistent with what we know about history. We can look at the data in yet another way. We can take all of those runs of homozygosity on each chromosome and we can stack them on top of each other within breeds and look at the density. Um, so density here means how many dogs within a breed, um, do we? Ex what per percentage of dogs do we expect to have a run of homozygosity at each segment of the genome? And so here you're seeing that the bright yellow colors are really high density. So many or all dogs have, have an inbreeding segment in that region and the dark blues represent low uh, low uh, incidence of runs of homozygosity, so more genetic diversity. Um, and it's kind of interesting here, right? So that, that's telling us something about the history of how, how inbreeding has affected the genome locally. Um, so the case at the top, well, what I'm showing you is, is, a, is an image of chromosome 32 in bulldogs, where we have the BMP3 locus, which was selected strongly um, to, to make the short faces that bulldogs have. Um, and you can see something similar in chromosome 32 locus that, that encodes furnishings and poodles. So the, the point I want to make here is that in each of these cases, we've, we've applied artificial selection in these breeds, um, and we were targeting a single mutation in each case. Um, but, but that selection actually reduced diversity in a, in a pretty big chunk of each of these chromosomes. Um, and so that, that's from an effect called linkage. Um, the, the mutation that we're selecting on is physically next to other DNA. Um, and as you're selecting on that mutation, you're going to carry with it, um, it with an effect we call hitchhiking, you're going to carry with it the surrounding variation. Um, and that's not in and of itself necessarily a bad thing. But if you have deleterious mutations that are really close on a chromosome to things that you're trying to select on, um, beneficial traits that you're trying to select on or desired traits, um, that can be bad. And, and there's, there's a number of cases of this in, across various dog breeds. So a pretty um, well-known case that, that Ryan Boyko mentioned yesterday in his opening talk um, is HUU in Dalmatians. So this is a really um, well-known case of hitchhiking due to artificial selection on a specific trait. Um, so this is a pretty bad uric acid defect. It leads to bladder stones in Dalmatians. And as Ryan pointed out yesterday, it can be kind of costly for owners when, it, when, when they have to treat this with surgery. Um, and it, it's an interesting case that was first described about a century ago. And, and over the past century, it, it was described various times that, that it seems like that this deleterious mutation that causes this defect is probably linked to spotting in Dalmatians because it was observed that, that, it, that both of these traits were fixed um, in Dalmatians. And it wasn't until about a century later, just, just about a decade ago, that, that this was first described genetically. Um, and the, the actual source of this defect was, was identified. Um, and so the, the point I wanna make here is that artificial selection on spotting likely drove this deleterious mutation to fixation in Dalmatians. Um, you know, and it's, it's great that we're now getting to a point where we can start to understand the genetic underpinnings of really um, negative traits like this um, because we, we can do things like outcrossing. Now, now that we know where this mutation is, um, Dalmatian breeders can, can do um, selective outcrossing to breeds like pointers and remove this mutation from the Dalmatian breed, which is great. Now, so, so, so that's, that's the third take home point I want to make is that, you know, we, we see this historical inbreeding and artificial selection from, from past breeding um, and, and the formation of new breeds has led to inf increased frequency of deleterious mutations in a lot of dog breeds. Um, so that's, that's something that, that we ha can observe and have to deal with um, in the dog healthcare world. So that's, a, that's an example of a really simple trait. Um, so, so with simple traits like that, simple traits or phenotypes, um, you know, with most traits, we, we can say that the trait or phenotype is a product of both genetics and the environment. So it's so a variation in genes and variation in the environment can lead to variation in that trait. Um, but in simple genetic diseases like HUU, um, there's not much impact of the environment. And we can say that 
the effect size of, of the mutation that underlies it is very, very high. And when we're talking about effect sizes, we're talking about the, the amount that that mutation contributes to the genetic variation that underlies that trait. So in this case, we know this one mutation underlies all of the, the effect of the phenotype. Um, so it's pretty simple. Well, we, we identify that one mutation and now we have a pretty good understanding of how to treat this condition um, or through, through the breeding process. And we understand the biology of how the how this condition arises. But unfortunately, a lot of the traits that we care about in dog health and wellness are much more complex than this. They're they're affected by many, many different genetic loci across the genome. They have impacts from the environment. They're a lot more complex. We call these complex traits. And when we look at complex traits, um, it, you know, in the, in the human world and also to, to some extent in dogs, which have been a little less studied, but, but we're, we're ramping up in the dog genomics world, um, we can see that complex traits, we, we tend to see distributions of effect sizes, right? So, so there's a lot of different genetic loci that affect these traits. They have different contributions to the trait um, and different inheritance. Each of those loci can have different inheritance patterns. So some of them might be recessive effects. Some of them might be other different kinds of effects. Um, and, and just this idea that, that many traits that we care about are complex is something I want everyone to keep in mind throughout the rest of this talk because it's because it's important. Because what, what I want to talk about for a lot of the rest of the talk is um, something called inbreeding depression. So inbreeding depression is the reduced survival and fertility of the offspring of related individuals. So when inbreeding leads to negative fitness or health consequences. Um, and so, you know, this happens when segments of inbreeding, those runs of homozygosity overlap the genetic loci that underlie um, complex health traits. And we usually try to identify whether a trait is affected by inbreeding depression by correlating um, coefficients of inbreeding with the trait of interest. So in this case, you're seeing a, a hypothetical um, drawing of um, COI against litter size. So, so an, a, a graph like this would tell us that litter size as, a, as a, an indicator of fitness is affected by inbreeding. And this is exactly what we see. So a couple of years ago, we, we, we started a collaboration with the more Santa's Creek time study. And just to give a plug for this study, it's it's really the, the golden retriever lifetime study is an amazing longitudinal study with, with a wealth of data. And we were really lucky to have the opportunity to work with it. And it was a great um, experience. Um, but what we saw, we, you know, we were able to look at this, this really great longitudinal data. And there's a lot of data for, on litter sizes. Um, so we're looking at the number of healthy offspring born to females. Um, the number of live offspring born to females. Um, and then we're looking at those females coefficients of inbreeding. And what we see when we look at that is that there is a, a strong association between coefficients of inbreeding and litter size in golden retrievers. And this, the, the size of this effect amounts to about one fewer puppy every 10% you go up in inbreeding coefficients. Um, so that, that may not seem like a lot, but you know, a range of two to three um, difference in, in litter size can, can over time mean have a big impact on the fitness of a population. We can also think about traits like longevity, lifespan. That's a, that's a really important fitness trait. Um, so, so our uh, Embark's chief science officer, Adam Boyko, who you heard from yesterday, if you were following along um, with his lab at Cornell, published a study with a much larger sample size of golden retrievers looking at longevity. And so what you're seeing here is in the upper left, you're seeing males compared to females. So we know that there's an effect of sex on lifespan with um, females living a bit longer than males. And then in the upper right and the lower left, um, we're he's splitting out those males and females and looking at the relationship between lifespan in segments of coefficient of inbreeding. So the blue curves represent dogs that have lower coefficients of inbreeding and the red are higher coefficients of inbreeding. What you're seeing is that those blue curves are shifted towards longer lifespans. And when we look at this in a statistical way in the lower right, you see that what they found is that there's a significant association between those coefficients of inbreeding and lifespan. So, so that's important. Um, and this is great because, you know, we're seeing a consistent picture within the golden retriever breed that that inbreeding is having an effect on important fitness related traits. At Embark, if you saw Adam Boyko's talk yesterday, um, he, he's, he focused a lot on on the tremendous resource that that Embark is building to try to to study 
health and longevity in dogs. And so we're trying to take that data um, in collaboration with our customers and, and understand inbreeding depression as much as we can. So, so for example, every year we do an annual health checkup. And with the data from last year, we had data from about 1,700 dogs, just under 1,700 dogs that had died. So we had full, complete lifespan information for those dogs. And we can measure their coefficients of inbreeding. We know we have information about other covariates that we know are associated with lifespan, like weight, sex, and whether a dog has been neutered. And we can put all that together in statistical models to try to understand this. And so, so again, we know that, that various traits like weight and body size are associated with lifespan. We know bigger, bigger dogs tend to live shorter lives than smaller dogs. We know um, from the data that I showed you previously, but also just anecdotally, we know that there are associations, there's correlations between longevity and coefficients of inbreeding. Um, but we also know that that there, there are some of these covariates are, are related to each other. So for example, we know that larger breeds tend to have higher coefficients of inbreeding than smaller breeds on average. And so an important question is, is this effect, is this correlation between inbreeding and lifespan that we're seeing, could it just be explained by uh, things like weight? Um, so we can, we can put this all into a statistical framework and ask that question. And to illustrate it graphically, um, we can say that these are independent, these, these have independent effects. So if we look at dogs that are the least inbred, the lower half of inbreeding coefficients compared to those that are on the higher end. Um, so you're seeing that in the yellow, um, which are the lower inbreeding coefficients and blue here, which are the higher um, coefficients. You can see that there's, despite the fact that they're both, um, the lifespan is decreasing with weight, there's a difference between those cohorts based on coefficient of inbreeding. So, the, so there is an independent effect of inbreeding um, compared to weight. We can look at, at larger extremes. So the, the lower fifth and the higher fifth in that distribution of coefficients of inbreeding, and that effect gets bigger. We can put, the, as I said, we can put this all into a statistical framework work to try to understand it. And what, what we see is that there's about an average of a two year difference in lifespan between the lowest COIs at around zero and some of the highest around 50%. Um, and there's, there's, so as you go from zero to 50%, you're seeing a linear reduction in lifespans across, across dogs. And that includes purebred dogs, mixed breed dogs. It, it's across all, all dogs. We can go a bit further uh, beyond lifespan. Um, so for example, in our annual health checkup, we ask owners, how would you rate your dog's overall health? Is it excellent? Is it good? Is it fair? Is it poor? Um, you know, and owners have a pretty good sense of how healthy their dog is. They know, they know what their dog's energy level is. They, they, can, they can be a good judge of, of the health of a dog. And so, so we wanted to know, you know, is there, is there a re relationship between inbreeding and how an owner would self-rate a dog's health? <clears throat> And we can account for all the things that I talked about um, related to lifespan, but we'll add age because we're talking about living animals now. And we also collect information about how, how much exercise dogs are getting because we know exercise is related to, to health and wellness. Um, and this is data from over 28,000 dogs. We can ask this question. What we're seeing, um, the, the positive thing is that the majority of dogs are, in, are, are reported to be in excellent health. And that's great. Um, that, that's great to see. But, but the negative thing that we're seeing is that as you increase those, those COIs, those inbreeding coefficients, you're seeing that um, <clears throat> the, there's a positive correlation between the, prob the COI and the probability that an owner is going to report a dog in non-excellent health. So as inbreeding goes up, you see that owners are more likely to say, well, my dog's not in excellent health, but it's good, fair, or poor. Um, so that's, that's an indicator that, again, that, that inbreeding is having an effect on the health of dogs. And we can break this up even more fine scale. So we ask owners, um, you know, has your dog ever been diagnosed with a range, a large range of complex diseases, respiratory conditions, allergies, cancers, um, lots of things like that. Um, and we can ask this question about each of these. <clears throat> So with our large data set of over 30,000 dogs, we asked this question, again, considering the same kinds of covariates, and that, that would be a lot of data to present, but overall, what we can say is that um, those inbreeding co coefficients, again, are positively correlated with the probability that a dog is going to be diagnosed with one of these complex diseases or more um, at some point in its life. So again, the more inbreeding increases, um, the more likely it is that, that dogs are going to be diagnosed with any range of complex diseases. So the take home here is that 
inbreeding is a significant predictor of longevity, of overall health, and the likelihood of being diagnosed with a range of complex diseases. Um, you know, but you might be that, you know, that that's, that's important. And it's important for us to understand that because there's things we can do about that now, which I'm going to come back to in a bit. Um, but, but I want to take, take a step and, and talk about, you know, what can we do with this information moving forward as, as we gather larger samples of dogs, as we get more information, what can we do? You know, ideally what we want to do is we want to, we want to understand where in the genome are, is, is this effect happening? Um, so what genetic variation is underlying these inbreeding depression effects? And by understanding that, we can think about things like um, identifying the genes underlying them, understanding the biology, designing drugs, um, thinking about therapeutics and gene therapies and all that futuristic kind of stuff that we want to, we want to bring dog health care into the future. Um, and so, so, you know, we want to try to do that. And you heard yesterday from Dr. Friedenberg and Dr. Boyko about genome-wide association studies, where we're trying to statistically correlate in a set of, of dogs that have a trait of interest and dogs that don't, so cases and controls. We're trying to look at those and see if there's a difference in the frequency of, gen of specific genetic variants to understand whether those genetic regions might be associated with that trait of interest. We can do a similar thing with inbreeding in what's called a homozygosity association study. And so we started to do a few of these with, with the data that I just presented, that 30,000 dog data set from our annual health checkup. Um, but just to give you an overview of what this looks like, again, we can look at cases and controls. And what we're doing is we're taking windows of the genome and we're saying, okay, how many dogs in the set of cases and how many dogs in the set of controls have a segment of inbreeding across this window of the genome. And what we're looking for are places where there's a really big difference between the cases and controls in terms of the frequency of those runs of homozygosity. So most of the places we look at in the genome, we're not gonna see a very, a very big difference between those two. What we're looking for are places where we do see a big difference. So this is the kind of thing we wanna see where, the, where they really stand out. We, we started doing this, as I said, we, um, I, I'm presenting here our data from, from um, the question we ask about whether a dog has been diagnosed with allergies of the skin, hair, fur, because it's one of our largest sets of cases. And so we have more statistical power there to ask this question. Um, and this is what we see. Um, what we want to be looking for are cases where these peaks and valleys are, are going beyond these dashed lines, because that tells us that this is a, this is a, an effect that you can't question as much, right? It's statistically significant. Um, we don't see any of those in this, in this preliminary study. Um, but if we take all of the, the regions that we looked at and we, we sort them based on the ones that are, are, you know, the most different between our cases and controls, um, the window that is the most different uh, includes a gene called rcor 3 And that's a gene that we know that has been associated in humans with allergies in the past. And so that's that's a promising sign that we're we're moving in the right direction. And as we build these data sets and they get larger, um, we hope to to use the the power of those large data sets to understand the genetic underpinnings of inbreeding depression. Just as a note, because I know that a lot of breeders and, and vets and people out there are interested in DLA, the dog leukocyte antigen um, system. This is a set of immune-associated genes um, on chromosome 12. It's similar to the human leukocyte anti antigen system. Um, in humans, we know that genetic variation in HLA genes are associated with, with a range of immune-related conditions, especially autoimmune diseases. Um, and so, so the question, you know, it, is there, is there, are there similar effects in dogs? Um, what we're seeing here with allergies is that we, we don't see any major effects um, when it comes to inbreeding in DLA. And we went a step further and we looked just yesterday, we, we took a look at um, variation in DLA that we can measure with the, the Embark genotyping array um, and, and looking at those owner reported health scores and and we we didn't see any association there either so so you know there's a lot more work to do when it comes to dla um but we're excited about where that can go as well but again i, I think this is promising for for um, better understanding how these uh how inbreeding results in inbreeding depression and understanding the biology of these traits and okay so so that's great um what do we do now um, what can we do with the information that inbreeding is associated with with these health conditions? Um, 
what we, we want to try to do um, in like as you know, as dog breeders, you want to try to preserve genetic diversity through the breeding process. Um, and if you if you were tuning in yesterday and you saw Dr. Savage's talk, she talked a bit about how this is being done uh, in the cotton top tamarind zoo population. Um, and she, she mentioned that, you know, the, the theory suggests that what you want to do if you have if you have control of a whole population like that is you want to um, select your mating pairs so that in the next generation, you're minimizing inbreeding in the population as a whole, and you're, you're using as many animals as possible in the population as parents. Um, that kind of system can be a bit challenging in companion animal breeding, like dog breeding, because we, very, no one really has control over, over an entire breed necessarily. Um, there, there are a lot of independent breeders that are, that are breeding on their own with, you know, in networks and things like that. So that can be a challenge to actually think about the, the population as a whole. So, so the question is, can you, can, you know, can you breed to minimize inbreeding in individual litters? And what, what will the effect of that be on the population as a whole over time, if individual breeders are, are doing that? Um, and this is something people are doing, you know, people are work, breeders are working with, with us at Embark, they're working with other genetic testing providers um, to try to minimize inbreeding in, in their litters. Um, and there's different technologies out there to do this. Embark, we're using a whole genome genotyping array with dense coverage across the entire genome. There are other genetic panels available, um, such as small microsatellite panels that, that folks are using to measure diversity, um, and in some cases actually um, choose mates for their dogs. Um, and so we had two questions that we wanted to answer about that. And one is, can you use those small genetic panels um, to maintain genetic diversity in a population? Does it actually work? Um, theory suggests that it might not. And so we wanted to actually test this. And secondly, um, can, we, can the loss of genetic diversity be slowed by just focusing on minimizing inbreeding in individual litters? Um, so to, to ask these questions, we conducted a simulation study last year. Um, we developed a model. It's kind of, you know, it's similar to, to the history of a lot of breeds where you have a large ancestral population that goes through a really sharp bottleneck during the formation of the breed. And then it expands again um, and you have breeding um, in that last so at the bottom, you're seeing the, the population expanding again. Um, and we're, we're applying mate choice in that, in that most recent part of time. Um, and the genomic model there is, is really a model of the entire dog genome. Um, so, so we're modeling genetic variation across the entire genome, uh, broken up into 38 chromosomes. On top of that genome-wide variation that we're modeling, we're throwing on 33 um, simulated microsatellite markers distributed across 25 chromosomes. And again, if you saw Dr. Boyko's talk yesterday, he mentioned that you can kind of see um, that that's a popular uh, microsatellite panel uh, that's the way that a popular microsatellite panel in dogs is, is designed. Um, so we wanted to actually understand how that works um, in simulation. And then we simulated the breeding of litters based on mating decisions to minimize inbreeding in offsprings. So you take a dog, you choose a mate that will minimize the inbreeding of, of its offspring. And what do we see when we do that? Um, first, if you do that and you're using that small genetic panel of microsatellites to guide your mating decisions, um, this is what you see. And so the thing to focus on here is the bottom panel where more negative values are, are saying that you're doing better at preserving diversity compared to random mating. Um, so what you see on the, so going from left to right, you're going further away from those microsatellite markers in the, the simulated chromosomes. And, and you see, as you go away from those microsatellites, you're doing worse and worse at preserving genetic diversity. And so the point here is that you, only, you can only really preserve genetic diversity where you're measuring it. So it's important to measure across the entire, across each chromosome. Um, and, and if we actually add up with this common microsatellite panel, how much of the genome are you actually covering? Um, it, it, it ends up amounting to about 5% of the genome that you're covering. So that's 95% of the genome that you're just ignoring. You're not measuring genetic diversity there. You're, you can't do anything about it. Um, in contrast, when we, when we use whole genome data to do the same experiment, um, every, you see that everywhere across the, the genome, um, you're getting kind of uniform preservation of diversity relative to random mating. So that's a good sign. And it suggests that, you know, genome-wide data is providing pretty uniform preservation of diversity um, in these kinds of mating schemes. 
So the take home there is that genome wide panels are necessary to preserve genetic diversity across the entire genome in a breeding program. Uh, and you can use those predicted litter COIs to choose mates. Um, and that's important in reducing inbreeding load in litters today. Um, Adam Boyko yesterday talked a bit about Embark's match, matchmaker feature. Um, you know, you can use tools like that to, to do this kind of work today in, in your populations. So um, to start to wrap up, I'm gonna try to save us a little time here since we got started a little late. Um, the take home points that I've, that I've presented today uh, are that pedigree-based COIs don't account for recombination events within individuals. And so, um, you know, we're, we're missing some information if we're just relying on pedigrees. Additionally, pedigrees can be incomplete um, or have errors in them, um, mistaken paternity, things like that. And that can lead to large underestimation of COI compared to directly measuring inbreeding coefficients from dense uh, genetic panels. We know that historical inbreeding and strong artificial selection in the formation of a lot of breeds has led to the increased frequency of deleterious mutations um, in, in quite a few dog breeds. But on top of that, a lot of the traits that we care about um, are complex. And, and we can look at those traits um, in terms of inbreeding depression. And we, we see that inbreeding is a significant predictor of traits like longevity, overall health, and the likelihood of a dog having been diagnosed with a range of complex diseases. And then finally, we want to use genome-wide genetic panels um, to preserve genetic diversity in mating programs. So you might be asking if you're a breeder out there in the audience, you know, what, that's great, what can I do now? Um, and, and so from, you know, I think our, our consolidated advice would be a few main things. Um, you want to use available genetic tests and services to avoid unnecessary inbreeding in litters. That, that seems like the, the sensible thing to do. You want to test for mutations that are known to associate with health risk and avoid pairings of dogs that would lead to unnecessary risk in the litter. So for example, you, you tend to want to avoid breeding carriers to carriers for recessive mutations, because you know that there's a chance that some of those offspring, one quarter of them, are going to, to be at risk for that, that deleterious disease. At the, the overall breed and population level, you want to keep as many breeding animals of both sexes in the gene pool as possible. So avoid things like popular sire effects. Um, if you think about this mathematically, right, if, if you're only breeding 10% of the males in a generation, uh, that's 90% of them that are carrying genetic variation that you're not passing on to the next generation. So you're losing a lot. Of, you can lose genetic variation very quickly um, by having large differences, what we call skew in, in sexes um, in breeding. And then finally, I think this is kind of the most important point I want to make is that Embark's customers and our research partners can collaborate with us um, in research by participating in research surveys and, and setting up um, collaborative research studies. Um, and this is really, you know, something we're very passionate about at Embark. We, we want to, um, you know, really, really be collaborative and, and leverage the power of this very large data set we're building with all the smartest people that we can <laughs> and try to, to make a big difference in, in dog health. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, yeah, I want to give a big thanks to everybody at Embark. Um, I, there's really no one at Embark that hasn't had a hand in this research in some way or another. Um, I want to, you know, the Morris Animal Foundation for um, allowing us to work with the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study data, um, which was important for some of the work that, that we've published and presented here today. Um, the Doberman Diversity Project um, has been working with Embark um, since the very beginning and has been really influential in shaping how we're thinking about studying um, inbreeding and inbreeding depression. And then finally, again, Embark's customers. Um, without the customers who are acting as citizen scientists and filling out research surveys every day, um, we wouldn't be able to do this work. So, so thanks to them. And I think I've got a little bit of time for a few questions. All right, I've got a little bit of extra time. Let's see, let me find some of these questions. So um, let's see, Gerald asked, um, this is a pre-submitted question, Gerald uh, from Dixie, Georgia uh, asked, when reading about inbreeding, various downsides are discussed, such as litter size, inbreeding depression, et cetera. At what level of inbreeding using COI do these issues start to occur? That's a good question. I've talked about that a little bit today. Um, but 
so so I guess I want to say that there's definitely an inclination to think about inbreeding as if there is some some hypothetical threshold above which you shouldn't cross. Um, but really, we have to think about it as I hope I've I've presented today. We have to think about it a little bit more statistically. Um, and the data we're seeing is that you know the effect of inbreeding depression increases linearly as as inbreeding increases in a population. So for you know basically, if you think about it from the perspective of a, of a single mutation that is deleterious um, and transmitted recessively. Um, the probability that that mutation is going to be inherited in two copies is going to increase the chance that 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 locus is going to be inbred. It's it's increasing linearly with inbreeding. So so you expect those effects to kind of add up as inbreeding adds up. Um, so so you know I think the thing is is really about the question is really about tolerance. How much inbreeding do you want to tolerate? And and that's probably more about you know something a question that you as breeders can answer in terms of the the health and wellness of your existing breed. Um, and you know what? What can you tolerate? Another question that came in. I, I think this one again is from Gerald. Um, he's, he asked, "My understanding is that all purebreds are, by definition, inbred to a certain extent. With even with careful selection within a breed, doesn't every generation get a little bit more inbred? Is there a theoretical limit as to how long a particular breed can be continued without crossing to another breed?" Uh, that's another really great question, and it's a really complicated question to answer, actually, um, because it, it brings us to some really fundamental um, topics in evolutionary biology and population genetics. Um, so in, in population genetics, we usually think about four forces, what we call forces of evolution. Um, so there are things like genetic drift, which is random variation in allele frequencies over time just due to the fact that populations are limited in size. Um, and so the effect of genetic drift, if it's if it's working by itself, is to re reduce genetic variation over time. And the thing with that is that the smaller the population is, the faster you're going to lose genetic diversity because the random fluctuations can be a little bit more extreme when you have fewer individuals. Um, selection, so natural selection in wild populations, artificial selection in, in domestic populations, um, is the directed change in allele frequency. So you're actually selecting on specific regions of the genome um, via the trait of interest. Um, and you know that is also reducing genetic variation. The effect of selection is, is to reduce genetic variation, but, uh, but more selectively within the genome. Um, but in contrast to that, you have mutations. M new mutations arise in every individual. Um, there's new mutations that are creating new genetic variation in a population. And you have what, what Gerald is alluding to is gene flow or migration or outcrossing that can, that can bring new genetic variation into a population. Um, and so I think the trick is, can a population without outcrossing generate enough new genetic variation via mutation faster than it's losing it via genetic drift and artificial selection? And so that's kind of a question about the number of breeding animals in, in a breed. Um, if, if the number of breeding animals remains fairly small, it's likely that, you know, variation is still going to continue to reduce over time. And with all the methods that I've talked about today, we can, we can think about slowing it by carefully choosing breeding pairs. Um, but, but, it's, but Gerald is correct that, that in many cases, there's, there's kind of a, a, there can be a point of no return, basically. Um, but there's kind of a, a practical aspect to that question, like, can we actually support enough dogs in, in each breed globally to maintain that mutational balance that you would need? Um, so, so I don't really have a perfect answer <laughs> to that question, but, but because it would take a lot of really careful thinking and modeling um, to answer it perfectly. But I, I, I can safely say, um, it, it's kind of reinforcing what I've said in my talk today, that to better preserve genetic diversity in, in each breed, um, you know, you want to use as many individuals in the breed as possible to contribute to the next generation. Um, and you, you want to breed to minimize inbreeding in litters. Um, and we should be monitoring. Um, I think the, the biggest point I can make is that in dogs, we can do a better job of monitoring the inbreeding and health of each of these populations over time. And that way we can detect when there are issues arising in a breed early and, and decide how best to address those issues. Um, so so that's, that's kind of what I think we need to be doing in those cases. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for presenting your research and answering those questions, Dr. Sams. Yeah, no problem. My pleasure. I um, actually want to leave you up here for just a quick moment because I thought um, a comment you made just a few minutes ago was particularly insightful. Um, you said there's no threshold to target um, 
but instead the effects of inbreeding are linear. And given this genetic COI is linked to lifespan and number of puppies in a litter, it's more that the lower the genetic COI score, the better. Right. And ideally breeders can work to lower this score in their lines by assessing the genetic COI of the prospective litter before the adult dogs are bred. Is that, do I have that all correct? Yeah, yeah, I think that's correct. Okay, okay, great, great. Well, I know that's uh, important guidance and uh, hopefully something we can kind of put more and more into practice. Definitely. Awesome, all right, well, great. Well, thank you again uh, for your time and presentation today. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Uh, so for those who, who don't know, um, Dr. Sams is principal scientist at Embark, is frequently relied upon not only within the company, but by our, our customers and partners as well. So you'll find him appearing in many of our educational videos um, that run both on our website and on Embark's Facebook page at Embark for Breeders. So thanks again for being here. Yeah. Thank you.